Welcome to this post-landing news conference for Space Shuttle Atlantis' STS-125 and servicing mission number four to NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. Although Atlantis' crew did land at uh, Edwards Air Force Base in California, we are here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and we have four NASA managers who will talk about the final shuttle flight to uh, the Hubble Telescope. NASA TV coverage will also uh, return to Edwards Air Force Base as soon as Atlantis' astronauts are off the shuttle and do their, uh, their traditional walk around the underside. So we may end up having to cut this news conference is a little short. We also have media at uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston and Dryden Research Center out in California. So let's get right to our introducing our panel. Uh, we have Ed Weiler, the Associate Administrator for Science Mission Directorate. Mike Moses, the Launch Integration Manager for the Space Shuttle Program here at Kennedy Space Center. Mike Leinbach, the Space Shuttle Launch Director. And John Madura, the manager of the NASA Weather Office here at Kennedy. We'll uh, start with opening comments and then open it up to questions. Dr. Weiler? Thanks. I'll keep this short because I'm anxious to see the astronauts come off, too. Uh, now and only now can we declare this mission a total success. The astronauts are safely on the ground. Uh, I was thinking about this this morning uh, coming over here. And uh, one of the reasons I've told many of you many times is why is Hubble seem to have such a popular uh, Event with the people of the United States, and I say it's probably because it's a great American comeback story. You know, the big problem in 1990, and then the miracle in space in 1993, and a long period of success. Well, it just dawned on me. We're, we've now entered the second chapter of the great American comeback story. This mission that just completed successfully uh, was canceled January 16th, uh, 2004. I remember that date because it was the day after my birthday. If you'd have told me on that day that I'd be sitting here five years later, the totally successful 5 EVA mission with a brand new Hubble once again that will probably operate well into the third decade of its life, I wouldn't have bet you a penny. But Hubble is the great American comeback story, Chapter 2. Uh, Mike Griffin put the mission back into the cube in uh, October 31st, Halloween, an auspicious day, 2006, and of course the rest is history starting now. Uh, the, the people at Goddard and the Space Telescope Science Institute uh, haven't been sitting on their hands. They're already in the process of checking out the instruments. Everything is going very smoothly. No problems so far. So once again, I'll end this mission as a truly great success. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Let's see. I'll, I'll expound on that and say that uh, I, too, concur. This was a fantastic mission. Uh, if you look at the back-to-back -back EVAs and the, and the ease at which we pulled it off, you know, we talked pre-flight. Um, about this being kind of a surgical repair mission, and then you saw some of the brute force that was needed too to, to rip a handrail off to, to get at the surgery. So hopefully the doctors weren't paying too much attention to that. But uh, it was a great mission. Um, you know, it, it's good to have Atlantis back on the ground. We wish you could have been here in Florida, but uh, California is a perfect landing too. So uh, on the ground is good. Uh, let's see, the, uh, the Atlantis team, the 104 team, really did a fantastic job. They had two cracks at this. You know, we, we tried back in, uh, in the fall and then we turned it around. Uh, when Hubble had the, the issue with the, the science computers. And we managed just to, to reload and put them in a way better posture than had that failure happen right after we lift off. So that was kind of a very fortunate timing of events. Uh, and the 104 team did great. I also have to give uh, credit to the 105 team, who's kind of stayed on hot standby the whole entire time um, with the STS-400 rescue mission, keeping that dual pad option available. Um, if you think about it, we've never done that before, had two vehicles ready to launch within seven days of each other. That's an amazing amount of, of processing work, especially given the, uh, the team sizes that we have these days compared to what we had decades ago. So a really good job. Uh, and then on orbit, the crew and the, and the team back in Houston did a good job of stretching the mission out consumables-wise to let us take as many shots here at Kennedy as we could. Uh, but as you found out today, the weather just wasn't quite stable enough to, to commit to landing, so we took our, uh, our good out to, to Edwards. On entry... Uh, you probably heard a couple of issues come back and forth with the crew. Uh, APU-2, auxiliary power unit number two, uh, which is used to generate pressure for the hydraulic systems, um, was violating a limit on its drain line temperature. Basically, it was right at the upper edge of the alarm limit. No issue whatsoever. It was just toggling right at the upper limit, which made that alarm come on and then go off and then on again up as the heater kind of cycled. Um, just a nuisance for the crew. We wish we could have turned it off, but uh, you're not able to do that at that point in the, in the countdown or in the, uh, in the entry profile. Um, so just a couple nuisance alarms for the crew, but the APU was running perfectly fine and, and uh, no issues for landing. So the teams are going to head out and get ready for ferry flight back. We'll get uh, Atlantis back here, get it back in the queue in the OPF and, and start processing again for its next mission. We looked ahead uh, 
the next flight, Endeavour 127, we're still targeting uh, the 13th of June for that flight. Um, you know, we had some weather delays over the weekend, uh, getting the payload in. We've had some uh, some other challenges with the, with the local weather that was affecting Atlantis as well. But the teams have been looking at; they don't think there's going to be any delays to the launch date. But I'm not pushing them for an answer right now. We're going to let them take this next week here, get things rolling, and see where we stand. But but I think the 13th of June is still a really good date for us. Um, we're going to kick off our shuttle FRR next week, and then the agency FRR is in the first week of June. So right right back to business of launching the next vehicle here. Um, that's all I had, Mike. I'll let you okay. answer. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, I, too, would like to congratulate the Hubble team. Um, I'm really looking forward to the images coming back down. And locally, Atlantis, uh, you guys are the best, and Endeavor. Um, everybody ready for Endeavor's launch. We had it ready to go in case we needed it. And uh, I went to their scheduling meeting every day, and, and the flexibility that that team um, uh, showed us was just outstanding. We're in the process of preparing her for her roll around to Pad A. That will happen next Friday night. And then again, as Mike said, we're targeting the 13th for, for that launch, and, and we're in good shape with that one. Um, we have a little bit of time off. We're going to take tomorrow off, and, and so that team's in good shape too. I'd also like to congratulate Norm Knight and the, and the flight control team in Houston. Uh, great calls today. Uh, the atmosphere was unstable, and, and John's here to answer all those questions about the weather, fortunately. And, uh, but he made a great call, and uh, so I was real proud of that. So we're ready to uh, press on now. Looking forward to the next mission and uh, getting Atlantis back in about eight or nine days or so. Thanks, John. Weather here in Florida was lived up to its reputation. It was dynamic and tough to predict. Uh, it was especially hard in this weather situation. We were trying to forecast uh, for around nine or ten o'clock in the morning when the weather is as especially vulnerable for for changes. Um, if you listen to any of the the interplay between the forecasters and the and Norm Knight, uh, you heard them talking about convective temperatures and outflow boundaries and e edges of anvils and a tremendous number of rules that uh, they had to consider and factors they had to consider. And my hearty congratulations to the uh, to the forecasters at Spaceflight Meteorology Group, especially Mark, uh, who under fire uh, had to answer those those very very tough questions and, and be on top of it. Uh, I've been I've forecasted around the world when I was in the Air Force, and there's no place that is harder to forecast than here, especially when you're trying to make a 60 to 90 minute forecast uh, as to whether or not you're going to meet a whole series of, of of different rules. We would have been violating uh, on the first rev uh, for sure. The second rev I'm not quite sure about uh, without an, an aircraft evaluation and whether or not the anvil that it's outside right now would have been uh, transparent or not. But we'd have been very, very close to, to that. And the reason we're concerned, we're concerned about the anvil is it may have electric charge in it, and we come down through it may trigger a, a, a lightning strike. But for sure, on the first on the first rev, due to uh, s the ceilings which are just coming across the field at landing time, and the and the and the thunderstorm anvil which was definitely within the the window and too close, uh, and the second one we were very, very close. So there were great calls. Uh, and they, they were calls that had to be made, I think, in, in favor of not coming here because we, there's a lot of unknowns that we didn't know how the weather was going to exactly develop and with what kind of timing. So, again, the congratulations to the, to the forecasters for that. And I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, we will open it up to questions now. Um, please wait for the microphone and then say your name, news affiliation, and who you'd like to answer your question. We'll start on the right side of the room here and work our way around. Once the microphone is not, yes, maybe move, there you go, move to the microphone, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to move me. Uh, I, uh, Eben Brown, Fox News Radio, for uh, either Mr. Moses, Mr. Lineback. Um, uh, I think it's safe to say that the scratches on the underside of the shuttle on the heat tiles uh, had uh, no effect today or were not a, a problem, and I wonder if you could reflect on that. And two, uh, has a shuttle ever, either an orbiter or a completed mated shuttle, uh, sat out in the elements uh, as long as Endeavour has, sitting out on that pad and, and undergoing all that weather uh, for that period? And will that affect anything uh, for Endeavour's mission? So I'll take the first part sure. and let you yeah, take that second one. Um, you know, the, we did all the analysis in flight about the TPS damage uh, to the tiles. Um, predicted no no impact whatsoever. You looked at the heating, there was plenty of margin. Now that we're on the runway, the team's going to go out and, and take some photographic surveys of that area. In fact, uh, I saw some paper come across my desk the other day that they want to go out and take mold impressions, basically uh, do an impression of the of the damage size that's there to compare to the photography we had 
in orbit and actually uh, actually see if anything changed due to entry. So, you know, we have to wait till that data comes back. If we would have landed here, I probably would have been able to tell you because we were out there looking at it. But uh, we're we're a little ahead of the schedule here with the press conference. So, don't expect there to be any any change in that damage uh, on the chine. Yeah, and relative to the time that 105 has been out at the pad, uh, I don't have the exact days for you. We can get that for you. Um, we've been out the pad for quite some time in the past, and the weather really doesn't bother us out there. We have good seals around the payload bay and around the, the hatch for the orbiter itself, for the crew module. So that doesn't really bother us that much. Um, we have very good lightning monitoring capability out there, and we have taken a couple strikes close to the launch pad over the last, uh, through the storm that we just endured, um, but no, no issue with the orbiter at all. Um, again, we have real good procedures in place to do a retest if we thought we had uh, experienced any kind of over, over voltage in the ship, but, but we didn't. So, uh, yeah, we've been out there a while, but it's okay. Endeavor is a good water type ship. Okay. With uh, Bill. I'm Bill Hart with CBS for the two mics. Um, for Mike Moses, um, ASA 1, you guys need that to make sure you don't have any issues downstream generically anyway for 127, I assume. Does going to uh, Edwards, um, I mean, will you have that data in time for your FRR for 127? And for Mike Leinbach, uh, is that is the diversion do anything with the workforce in terms of processing 127 in the context you've only got a week uh, to get that flight off or it goes into July? Thanks. Let's see, for the, uh, the ASA problem that we had, we talked about that. We had a, a, a review board in flight just to talk about some of the issues we had coming up on, on flight readiness review for next week. Um, and basically, we do need to close that issue. You can close it in a lot of different ways, right? We need to understand what happened to us. So um, some people have interpreted that to mean we got to go find where exactly the short is, track it down, and then go look at that same exact location in Endeavor. Uh, if you think about it, though, if you could have wire damage somehow that, that could cause a short, you really you might want to look at that particular because of a traffic uh, loading on the ground somebody if there's you know if it's a high traffic area people are walking around a lot you might want to look but in general we could take some of that damage anytime anywhere in the vehicle and our systems are kind of built to handle that we know that's a hazard we know that's a risk um, it, one of the reasons why there's four aces is uh, is to provide that redundancy so we definitely need to close the issue and when we say close we don't mean that it's done and we're not going to talk about it anymore close means we have closure we know what it was and we know how it could affect us on the next flight if, uh, if we want to see an, an, if this is a short in the wiring the on-orbit data really leads us to believe it is because the box was trying to respond initially before it truly lost power so that tells you that the short was kind of to ground a little bit outside the box if you've worked on electrical systems, you know you might not find that short. It, it could have been a momentary contact to structure, and it could be gone. So when we go and hook up uh, the meters to it and, and scope it and try to find where that short is, it might not be there. So actually, on Atlantis, finding that short is definitely going to be a constraint to launch because you've got bare wire somewhere you want to go find it. But for Endeavor, you, you can't really postulate you have the same exact condition. Um, if we found that it was truly an issue inside the box, then we want to talk a little more about common cause. We kind of think we have enough data now to know that we're not in that camp, although we will definitely go check. So before shuttle FRR with us landing at Dryden, we won't have all of that data, uh, but we typically sometimes have to carry a lot of open work through FRR anyway. Uh, and certainly before we fly, we will have that data in hand and be ready to go. Uh, and ultimately, if we, uh, if we don't have data we think we need, we'll hold up and launch and, uh, until, we, until we get the data we do need. Okay, and relative to the processing of, of the next vehicle, you know, because we did land out west, that was one of the uh, one of the key things we did in the processing meetings is make sure we had sufficient workforce to go out to California, process Atlantis, and get her ready to come home. In addition to processing Endeavor here, um, when you think about it, there's not much left to do on Endeavor. Um, we've disconnected the ordnance yesterday in preparation for the roll around to Pad A. Um, we're going to adjust the hypergolic load Tuesday, and once that's done, we're essentially done with our work at Pad B. We'll take it around to pad A and put the ordinance back on and um, insert the payload and uh, be ready for launch countdown. So the, a lot of the work on Endeavor is already done. We already got a good head start on that over at pad B. Uh, the payload today is being transferred from the canister on, onto the PIGM, the payload ground handling mechanism in preparation for the orbiter arrival. arrival. And uh, so I can tell you w without a doubt we have sufficient people to process and make that 13th launch day. It's just, it's just not an issue for us, Bill. Okay, Irene. Thanks. Um, Irene Klotz um, with Reuters. Um, a couple questions for Mike Leinbach. Um, will, um, when does Pad B then formally uh, get turned over to uh, Constellation? Uh, formally, um, I think there'll be some sort of a turnover ceremony. I'm not quite sure when that's scheduled for, but, but essentially, once we roll off, um, the shuttle program is done with Pad B. 
And uh, for um, Ed Weiler, um, two, two questions. The first is, I think, a quick one. If you could just give us a little update on the, um, the uh, progress of the Hubble checkout since, the, uh, since it was re-released. Okay, I just got a dump on that literally a half an hour ago. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, initial electronics checks, uh, calibration checks, internal calibrations. We haven't seen any starlight yet. Uh, all those so far have gone beautifully, so I anticipate no uh, issues uh, in meeting our goal of getting uh, the first data to you people probably by the uh, end of August or so. So everything's going well as far as I can tell. For you, um, with the announcement yesterday of um, uh, Charlie Bolden being nominated for NASA Administrator, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about having another astronaut in charge of the agency and what impact that might have for your particular area of space science. Thanks. Well, uh, I can say, you know, the it's clear that there a lot, there's a lot of excitement about Charlie's nomination. Um, a lot of people know Charlie well. As you said, he was an astronaut. I have a special connection to Charlie because uh, he actually was uh, an astronaut on board uh, the shuttle in 1990 that launched our Hubble Space Telescope. And he also chaired the uh, independent review team that reviewed this mission that we just completed. So Charlie has a connection to uh, both NASA and to actually science program. It's a little premature now to uh, you know uh, anticipate what may or may not happen. Uh, there is a confirmation process we have to remember, and that could take uh, you know who, know who knows how long that can take. But the Senate has to confirm. Them. Todd, uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today. Uh, one for Ed Weiler and one for Mike Leinbach. Ed, I'm wondering uh, once you're through with the uh, commissioning of the upgraded Hubble. What types of investigations, scientific investigations, are going to have first dibs on the observatory, if you will? Oh, God, that's, that's a tough one, uh, Todd. I don't have in my mind the schedule for Hubble, but I can guarantee you that as soon as the uh, uh, observatory is operational, uh, people have been waiting for you know, literally years to execute the obs first observations with COS and with uh, with uh, with pick three and of course uh, the uh, the rise of the fe two phoenixes our two dead instruments will also be used. Uh, some of the investigations will be deep surveys, uh, dark energy surveys, uh, studying the string structure, cosmic string structure in the universe with COS. Uh, you know, it's hard to single out anyone because Hubble is a, is a user facility that can basically look at any object uh, uh, in the solar system other than Venus and Mercury and the Sun, uh, all the way out to the very edges. So, uh, and I have a firm policy of not predict predicting what the best discoveries will be because I'm always wrong when I do that. And uh, for Mike Leinbach, um, you mentioned roll around on Friday night. I thought that had moved to Saturday, and I wanted to double check that. And it sounds as if, if you're going to be done with hypers and whatnot on Tuesday, that you might even be able to go earlier. Uh, well, you're thinking like an ops guy now, Todd. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad. I'm glad to see you've, you finally come around. Um, <laughs> um, no, we're, we're rolling at midnight Friday night. Triple balls one Saturday morning, as we say. After we're done with the hypers, there, there's a lot of work to get ready to roll around. We have to disconnect all the gases and power and the data systems and all that kind of stuff. So there, there's plenty of work to do to fill up those days. So now don't look at, don't look for us to go a day early. Although I like the idea. I'm going to take one more question here at, uh, at Kennedy, and then we'll go to Johnson Space Center for questions there. Sorry, Tark. Thank you, uh, Tark Malik with Space.com and Space News for Dr. Weiler. You mentioned that this mission has been a, a great success, but I'm uh, wondering if. Uh, you and your team, you know, really thought at your hearts that this crew would get everything uh, and then some done. Um, and then also, if there's some bittersweet feelings knowing that this was the last uh, flight to the uh, Space Telescope. No, I, I remember uh, going all the way back to the 93 mission where we had uh, five EVA scheduled and a broken telescope, a mirror that wasn't focusing, and we had an aggressive schedule. And if you asked us the night before that, would we be happy with 50 percent, would have said absolutely. But then these astronauts have this bad habit of doing more than we ever anticipated they could do. And so we got used to that kind of behavior. So uh, I've often said that, uh, you know, these, these trips uh, aren't like trips to the grandma's house, shuttle missions. Uh, this was an especially difficult to gram trip to grandma's house because in addition to putting in new uh, appliances for grandma, she had the nerve to ask the astronauts to fix appliances that were broken. And uh, the heck of it is, they did it. And uh, Am I surprised? 
I guess I, I'm happy that they were able to do it all, but surprised? Probably not, because I kind of, you know, I, I know John Grunsfeld very well, and he was telling me what he was doing and the practicing he was doing to uh, work on ACS. I thought ACS was impossible to fix. But when John told me he, he, he could do it, I, I believed it. But he did make it look awfully easy, didn't he? <laughs> Okay, we'll go to the Johnson Space Center in Houston for a couple of questions there. Hi, uh, Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. Question for one of the two mics. Um, it seems now with, with Hubble in your immediate rearview mirror that the task at hand is um, to finish the International Space Station. And I was hoping that uh, one of you might sort of address the, the, the notion that sort of space station is, is really what's left on the, the space shuttle program's plate and whether you think that you'll be able to complete the station within the remaining manifest of missions. Well, let's see, you know, uh, we've known for, for quite a while with the uh, the new direction, the new vision for space exploration that we're going to phase out shuttle, uh, move on to Constellation, uh, and, and that goes with assembling and completing the International Space Station and thus the Hubble servicing mission that we just finished up. So there's not really any uh, any new revelation there. That's just the way it's been. Uh, the Hubble mission's kind of uh, been a challenge to, to, to work into the schedule in terms of it's a, it's a complicated thing, needing both pads for the rescue. So there's a little bit of, of a sigh of relief that we're, the hard part of the scheduling is over, but if you look at the manifest remaining, the schedule's just as hard. Um, we got Ares 1X that we need to get launched and, and work them in and make sure they have a su successful mission um, and, and then finish off the manifest. You know, it's a challenge. I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again. You know, I don't look too far down the manifest, kind of one flight at a time. There's only every couple of weeks that I get to look long range and talk about the schedules with the team. But mostly we're just taking a, that next mission and making sure we get that one uh, safe and successful. So from that standpoint, yeah, we're right back in the business of uh, station assembly. Uh, but we've kind of been in that business all along, so so no real revelation there for me. I might just add that the uh, the last major piece of the International Space Station arrived here at the Kennedy Space Center, I, I believe, two days ago, mm -hmm. on the Beluga. It's Node Three from the Alenia Space Agency, the Italian Space Agency, and and uh, so that's here now. They'll start their processing over in the SSPF here in the next day or so. I think we have additional questions from Johnson. Robert. Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com with a, a, a question about Hubble and its legacy. Um, this is the last mission, and it was it was mentioned that it wasn't even expected once it was canceled that it would come back, and now it's been successful. Part of that comeback was re, was a result of uh, the grassroots movement, uh, the public responding to how much they love Hubble. How do you manage today the the grassroots support that's still there, knowing that this is the last one and that they might want to see us go back again? Well, I think, uh, I think part of the issue there was it was a planned mission that was canceled. It was having something taken away from not only the astronomy community, uh, but the public, frankly. Uh, that was five years ago. We've now come a long way, and now we're looking to another five to six or seven years. You know, in the meantime, we've got uh, even larger telescopes about to be launched about that time frame in the middle of the next uh, decade, uh, 2014 JWST, which will be a 6.5 meter telescope. The one thing you can't do to Hubble is you can't change the size of the mirror. And that's really important to astronomers. Astronomers collect light. And the more, the bigger the mirror is, the more light you collect. You can make better instruments, et cetera, but you can, you're always going to be limited by the 2.4 meter mirror. And Hubble's a warm telescope. Uh, it's replacement of the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which will hopefully be launched before Hubble's even getting sick again. Uh, as I said, a 6.5 meters, it's a cold telescope, which means it can look at the infrared part of the spectrum. Why is that important? Because what Hubble can't do is see all the way back to the very beginning of when stars became stars and galaxies became galaxies. To do that, you have to go very, very deep in time and space. When you do that, you, the light gets redshifted. It gets redshifted to the infrared. So to really do a good job on that, you really have to go to the infrared. So uh, in the infrared, JWST will be about 100 times more efficient, effective than Hubble. And basically, that's what the National Academy of Sciences told us to do in 2001. They specifically said we should aim to do one more Hubble servicing mission and hopefully get to about 2010 before Hubble died. 
uh, for no good reason other than the delays, we're actually going to exceed the uh, National Academy's recommendation. We're going to be able to keep Hubble going well beyond 2010, maybe to 2015, 16, or 17. And the other part of that recommendation was follow up Hubble with the James Webb Space Telescope. So I hope that's kind of a long answer to what might have been a simple question, but I think it's important for the record. Hey, we have no more questions at uh, Johnson and uh, no questions at Dryden, so we'll come back here for a few more and we'll we're starting this out with uh, James. James with Florida Today. As we say on this side of the room, we'll go back to the other side. James Dean with Florida Today. Just wondering if you could outline the timeline for the ferry flight and, and uh, Atlantis' return. Well, let's see. Ferry flight's normally planned on day seven out there in, in California today. You know, depending on how you look at the manifest today, either counts as day one or day zero. Um, it'll, it'll be day seven. That's, that's kind of what we do. We, we like to confuse things. Um, <laughs> it'll, it'll be about a week, seven to eight days. It'll be in the air. And then pending favorable weather, um, this time of the year, it's probably a two-day ferry, I would expect. I'm Jim Siegel. I'm with the Celebration Independent newspaper. I know that you were very concerned in this mission about the space debris that's floating around up there and the possibility it could cause some problem to, uh, to Atlantis. Do you have any sense of how close some of that debris actually got and how, uh, how much of a threat it was in real time during the flight when it happened? Well, see, that falls into, uh, basically, we put that in two separate buckets. There's the orbital debris that we can track with our ground-based systems. Um, I would assume that we had some uh, encounters that were in the kind of near us range. Um, that happens not often, but on any altitude flight, there's there's debris up there that we can track, and and we have a really good system notification through the, the space network um, to the uh, to the teams in Houston, where they basically identify that that uh, probability of collision. You know the the orbital velocity and position of the shuttle or the space station and that debris, and you compare the two, and you, you compute a probability of collision. Uh, and depending on where that probability falls, we have rules that tell us whether we we do something about that or not, maneuver out of the way, or uh, or in the station's case, uh, prep for for shelter if if it did hit. Um, we didn't have any of those events that required maneuvering. We could have had some that were outside that box uh, that the teams knew about, but they didn't bubble up to my level, so I don't I don't know about them. The other flavor of debris that we're worried about is the stuff we can't track, which is that micrometeorite orbital debris that's really small. That's just kind of like a background flux of, of space junk uh, that's up there. That we don't know if we've had close encounters because we couldn't track it in the first place. And that's where you see that we use these probability models to compute Basically, we know the uh, the density of the debris at that altitude. We know the time will be there and the exposure angles based on the, the attitude we fly the shuttle. And then based on that attitude, we know what critical parts are exposed to that debris, how much damage they can take. It's a really complicated little algorithm. But at the end, it, it, it spits out the, uh, the risk that we have to that background debris environment. And so for that, we don't really know. Um, we do know we got a, a for example, on uh, panel 11R on the, the, the left side, wing leading edge. We have uh, accelerometers behind the wing. One of them rang uh, in a signature that makes us believe was an MMOD hit. Um, when we looked during late inspection, we couldn't detect a thing. For the level of hit that we took, uh, it was, it's very plausible that we just could not detect it. It was below, way below detection thresholds and critical damage size, obviously. Um, they're going to be looking at that as soon as they get back on the ground to see whether that truly was a hit or, or if it was just a ringing of the sensor, which happens as the wing thermally buckles and shifts around. So, um, so that would be an example of something that, that maybe came close. But we actually have those on station missions, too. So, um, so there's, a, again, a long-winded answer to a short question that can't really tell you. If I could add 20 seconds, uh, there's a unique thing uh, called the WIFPIC 2, the Whitefield Camera 2, the camera that saved Hubble. It's coming back down on the shuttle bay. It's down in Edwards right now. It's got a radiator, which is about yay big by yay big. It's been exposed to space at that altitude for not 13 days, but for 16 years. And one of the very interesting things to help these models out is actual data. You'll be able to count meteorite impacts or, you know, specs and how deep they are and do uh, really help out some of these models. And that'll be some of the work that's done at Goddard once they get the uh, WIFPIC-2 back. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I want to make sure we get back to uh, Edwards Air Force Base and the crew. So a you know, couple of quick last questions. Sorry, the other side of the room. Tark. Thank you. It's uh, Tark Malik from Space.com and Space News. Again, I just had one follow-up with uh, Dr. Weiler. Uh, the last time we spoke with you, the, uh, the shuttle I don't, I don't think had left Hubble yet, and um, 
And uh, I know that the downlink did not come down uh, when they did uh, depart them live at the time, but I'm curious now that you had a chance to, to see it leave um, the shuttle for the last time, kind of what you thought, maybe what the team uh, thought uh, with those last parting glances. Thanks. I was actually with Chris Scalise and Senator Mikulski from Maryland at Goddard watching that. Uh, uh, we didn't see the real time because it wasn't in real time, but they had an animation. And I can say this, uh, uh, all of us had, uh, I wouldn't say wet eyes, but it was, a, it was an emotional moment because we knew that was probably the last time humans would see the Hubble, uh, assuming that the deorbit mission is done with a robot, but it might not be. It might be done with uh, Orion. But uh, still, uh, you know, it's been, a long, it's been a long run, but I try to, I want to get people off of the negative aspect of this being the last. I mean, geez. I mean, we just repaired the Hubble Space Telescope. We've got a new telescope. Four new instruments, two of them dead, now alive. I mean, we've got another five, six, seven, eight years uh, with a new telescope. These are truly the best of times, not the worst of times. Please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, please, one more question. About any, any other ones? <laughs> All right, not seeing any, let's go back to uh, Mission Control Houston and uh, NASA TV's post-landing coverage of Space Shuttle Atlantis' STS-125 and Servicing Mission 4. Thank you.